I am Dr. Sharon Shah, Assistant Professor of ENT, Government Medical College, Alapura. This is a lecture for MBBS students regarding the complications of otitis media. The middle ear is like a box with six sides. It has six walls. An anterior wall, posterior wall, roof, floor, medial wall, and the lateral wall is the tympanic membrane, which is not shown here. When the inflammation extends beyond the middle ear, or it involves structures like facial nerve, it is called complication. This is the temporal bone. The bony part of the external notary canal, middle ear and inner ear is situated within the temporal bone. So if the disease process extends beyond the middle ear but still confined within the temporal bone, it is called intratemporal complication. If the disease extends even beyond the temporal bone and reaches the dural venous sinus, meningeal layers, brain, then we call it intracranial complication. In some test books, Intratemporal complication is also described as extracranial complication. Just by remembering this diagram, we can tell the intratemporal complications of otitis media. Now, if the disease extends posteriorly, here the mastoid air cells are present. So, it will lead to mastoiditis. That is the first intratemporal complication. Now, if the disease, this disease extends medially, Inner ear will get involved, that is labyrinthitis, second intratemporal complication. Now we can see the facial nerve, see in the medial and posterior wall of the middle ear. If the disease involves the facial nerve, it will lead to facial nerve palsy, which is the third intratemporal complication. Now this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. If the disease extends up to the petrous apex, it is called petrositis, which is the fourth intratemporal complication. So these are the four intratemporal complications of otitis media. The intracranial complications will be dealt in a separate video. Let me start with acute mastoiditis. The mucosa of the eustachian tube middle ear, aditus and antrum are continuous known as the middle ear cleft. So the inflammation from the middle ear will naturally extend to the mucosa of the mastoid antrum. But when the inflammation extends beyond the mucosa of the mastoid air cells and it, when it involves the mucoperiosteum of the mastoid air cells, not the mucosa, when it breaches the mucosa and when it involves the mucoperiosteum of the mastoid air cells or the bony walls of the mastoid air cells, then only we, we call it as mastoiditis. Just by involving the mucosa of the mastoid air cells, it is not mastoiditis. When it breaches the mucosa and when it involves the bony walls of the mastoid air cells, then we call it as mastoiditis. High virulence of the organism, low resistance of the patient, well pneumatized mastoid will favor the development of mastoiditis. Beta hemolytic streptococcus is the most common cause to organism. The pathology is extension of inflammatory process to the mucoperiosteum li lining of the mastoid air cell system. It will increase the amount of pus produced due to large surface area involved. So the pus produced will be greater than the pus drained out, which will lead to accumulation of the pus under tension and hyperemia and engorgement of the mucosa which causes dissolution of the calcium from the bony walls of the mastoid air cells. This will cause distraction and coalescence of the mastoid air cells and all these septations will be lost. Converting the whole mastoid air cells into a single cavity filled with pus called the empyema of the mastoid. So this pus may break through the mastoid cortex leading to subperiosteal abscess and if it bursts it will lead to a discharging post auricular fistula so the symptoms include persistent pain increase in the intensity or recurrence of pain of once it has subsided 
persistent fever or recurrence of fever persistent ear discharge the signs include mastoid tenderness which can be elicited by applying pressure over the simba conge the mastoid process and the tip of the mastoid then pulsatile ear discharge may be seen known as the lighthouse sign so even after mopping the discharge it may again fill up that's called the reservoir sign then due to periostasis of this bony wall between the mastoid antrum and the external artery canal there will be sagging of the posterior superior meatal wall the tympanic membrane may show perforation there may be swelling over the mastoid then conduct the hearing loss management include investigations and treatment so investigations include complete blood count pus from the middle ear to be sent for culture and sensitivity for proper selection of antibiotics x-ray mastoid 15 degree cephalocaudal loss view may show clouding of ear cells and treatment is start with antibiotics we no need to wait for the report of pus culture and sensitivity we can start with ampicillin and metronidazole may be added for anaerobic coverage proper ear toilet should be done that is suction clearance of the ear and sometimes the pus may block the perforation of the tympanic membrane so we, we have to keep that patent by removing the all the secretions from the external artery canal in some test book meringotomy is given as a treatment for mastoiditis i think it is a misleading because uh, usually if patient presents with a uh, patient with acute otitis media present with severe ear pain and on, and on examination the tympanic membrane is seen bulging out with pus then we may do we can do a meringotomy to let out the pus otherwise meringotomy is not at all indicated for the treatment of mastoiditis if the conservative treatment fail that is if there is no change in the condition of the patient if the subperiosteal abscess is there if there is sagging of the posterior superior meatal wall or the reservoir reservoir sign is there sign is there then we have to go for the surgical management that is the surgery to exenterate all the accessible mastoid air cells and to remove the pus that is the cortical mastoidectomy actually cortical mastoidectomy was originally designed to drain pus from mastoid air cells in case of mastoiditis so in the examination of point of view if you are asked about a disease always classify and write that is first definition then etiology then pathology then clinical feature and that to symptoms sign then management when whenever you are asked about management never jump and tell to the go to the treatment part always management will start with investigations then only we have to go for treatment treatment also if there is a conservative management always tell about that first never jump to the surgical management first so start with medical management then only go about, tell about the surgical management this is applicable not only for ent but all other subjects now there is another entity called the latent mastoiditis that is slow destruction of the mastoid air cells without acute signs and symptoms due to inadequate antibiotic treatment and in immunocompromised patients the management is similar to acute mastoiditis there are numerous named abscesses described in relation to mastoiditis one is the post auricular abscess is here the post auricular abscess then zygomatic abscess that is infection of the zygomatic air cells at the posterior root of the zygoma then basolt abscess which is very important for the examination point of view but even though it is very rare nowadays now i already described about the empyema of the mastoid in the previous slide that is the whole mastoid air cells converted into a single cavity filled with pus and if that pus breaks through the medial side of the tip of the mastoid this is the tip of the mastoid so if it breaks through the medial side of the tip of the mastoid and presents as a swelling in the upper part of the neck it is called a basolt abscess now if you see a neck swelling in a patient with ear discharge never jump to the conclusion that the patient is having basolt abscess Uh, the most common swelling in the neck is um, um, mainly uh, lymph 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 nodes so the it is very rare and the, uh, the, the there are various tracks for that uh, abscess it may lie uh, one possibility is that it may lie deep to the sternocleidomastoid pushing the muscle outwards 
then it may follow the posterior belly of the digastric and it may present as a swelling uh, between the tip of the mastoid and the angle of jaw then it may also get lie, lie in the posterior triangle so the patient presents with pain fever tender neck swelling torticollis investigation include high resolution ct scan of the temporal bone along with an ultrasound gram ultrasonogram of the neck and treatment include iv antibiotics drainage of abscess followed by cortical mastoidectomy other named abscess include lux abscess that is seen in the deep deep to the bony external canal due to break, due to due to, break, due to break in the uh, bony wall between the antrum and the bone and the ear canal then another another abscess is the sitalis abscess now the second complication of second intratemporal complication of otitis media that is labyrinthitis that is when the disease process extends beyond the mid layer and it reaches the inner ear this is the labyrinthitis we can broadly classify labyrinthitis into circumscribed labyrinthitis and diffuse labyrinthitis circumscribed means it is, is very much localized it's also called as labyrinthine fistula see here in this diagram we can clearly appreciate the prominence of the lateral semicircular canal so if the extension of the disease process directly to the lateral semicircular canal it causes erosion of the bony capsule of the lateral semicircular canal and leads to fistula that's labyrinthine fistula the commonest site is lateral semicircular canal the commonest semicircular canal involved is lateral semicircular canal so there will be a communication between the mid layer and inner ear so membranous labyrinth get exposed and become sensitive to pressure changes so if we do a fistula test by applying pressure on the tragus that pressure get transmitted from the external notary canal to the mid layer and from the mid layer to the inner ear that is the it will get transmitted to the membranous labyrinth of the lateral semicircular canal and the, the it will cause uh, the stimulate the endolymph will flow towards the cupula here the endolymph will flow towards the cupula so that is called the ampullopetal flow of the endolymph this will cause excitation of the lateral semicircular canal and it, the patient will present with vertigo and nystagmus with the quick component of the nystagmus towards the affected ear at this point i would like to clarify some points please don't get confused that is when we stimulate labyrinth or whenever there is an irritating lesion of the labyrinth the direction of nystagmus is towards the same side that is towards the affected ear in case of in case of a paralytic lesion of the labyrinth the direction of nystagmus is towards the opposite ear that is towards the normal normal ear here the investigation include high resolution ct scan of the temporal bone remember a high resolution ct scan of the temporal bone should be taken in all cases of otitis media when we suspect complication and treatment antibiotics mastoid exploration to remove the pathology from the labyrinth and to seal the fistula so that is about the circumscribed labyrinthitis now other other lab type of labyrinthitis the diffuse labyrinthitis that is the whole this diffuse involvement of the labyrinth not localized and it is again divided into serous and separate that is when there is diffuse involvement of the labyrinth but there is no pus formation it is called a serous labyrinthitis it is a reversible condition but when there is diffuse inflammation of the labyrinth with pus formation inside the labyrinth with permanent loss of vestibular and cochlear function that is called separate labyrinthitis both will present with vertigo nausea vomiting as i told earlier we can consider serous labyrinthitis as an irritative lesion of the labyrinth so the direction of nystagmus is towards the same side and separate labyrinthitis is a type of paralytic lesion of the labyrinth and the direction of nystagmus is towards the opposite side but still from the clinical features it is difficult to distinguish between serous and separate labyrinthitis so it is the classical teaching is that the diagnosis is often retrospective that is if the patient uh, develop develops permanent hearing loss following labyrinthitis it is a separate type of labyrinthitis but if the hearing loss resolves then it is serous labyrinthitis and the treatment is bed rest antibiotics and the use of labyrinthine sedatives like prochlorpyrazine now coming to the the third complication that is facial paralysis that is when the disease process extends to the involve when it involves the facial nerve 
facial nerve is seen in the medial and posterior wall of the middle ear so if, uh, it is protected in a bony canal and in some patient the bony canal may be dehiscent which predisposed to facial nerve palsy in chronic otitis media squamosal disease the cholesteatoma destroys the bony canal of the facial nerve and directly involves the nerve it is usually insidious in onset and the patient presents with deviation of angle of mouth and in inability to close eyes etc here also high resolution ct scan of the temporal bone should be taken and surgical treatment may be needed that is mastoid aspiration and inspection of the facial nerve and if the granulation tissue has invaded the nerve resection and grafting may be needed this is a wide discussion area mainly for postgraduate student so i am not going into the details now the uh, fourth complication is petrositis that is when the disease extends up to the petrous part of the temporal bone and reaches up to the petrous apex it's a very rare complication well nematized well nematized petrous bone will predispose to petrositis and great nigo syndrome is the classical presentation that is it consists of a triad when there is involvement of the abducens nerve it causes lateral ductal palsy involvement of the trigeminal nerve causes deep seated retro uh, orbital pain then persistent ear discharge that is the three triad in great nigo syndrome investigation include high resolution ct scan of the temporal bone and mri brain brain the treatment include iv antibiotics and if the uh, conservative management fails mastoid aspiration may be needed and the fistula tract from the middle ear and mastoid to the petrous apex uh, should be traced so from the uh, last 10 who has question papers three questions have been asked from this topic one is basolar abscess then acute coalescent mastoiditis then lateral sinus thrombophlebitis it is an intracranial complication of otitis media and it will be described in the next class thank you for your patient hearing